Hello, I'm Dr. John Cruz, and today I'm going to be talking about the connection between hoarding and ADHD. So I'll be talking for about 20 some minutes. Um, I'll be available for questions at the end of this time. This video may well be longer than 20 minutes. Again, the presentation is only about 20, but if there's questions, it could go twice as long. And if you aren't here live, you can write in questions. I will answer and respond to them there. And as usual, I will start with the take home message, which is there is a connection between hoarding and ADHD. So since 2013, hoarding disorder has been its own condition under the DSM-5, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Health, Mental Diseases. Um, so there's been accumulating research since that time that actually shows a stronger association between hoarding disorder and ADHD than with any other mental health condition, including specifically the OCD spectrum issues where it was previously lumped. Now, despite the presence of some television shows and lots of media attention about cluttering, most experts in the field still think it's substantially underreported and underrecognized and undertreated. And the bottom line is we don't have a huge amount of research on treatment options, but the standard best approach seem to be cognitive behavioral based therapies. Um, many people don't respond to those and particularly the use of body doubling is an ADD term or clutter buddies or peer assistance seems to be particularly helpful in addressing hoarding disorders. So, that's the take home message and now to the meat of it. So as I said, that it wasn't until 2013 that hoarding disorder became its own official category or official diagnosis. Previous to that, it was either lumped with obsessive compulsive disorder, which means that someone has either obsessive thoughts and worries often that seem illogical, that if I don't cross myself three times before I cross the street, a car is going to hit me or someone on the other side of the world will die, or compulsions, so an overwhelming desire, or not desire, a need to line up their labels on all their items in their medicine chest or in their cupboard so they're all aligned properly, or some action that's making things aligned or checking or arranging things in a certain way. Or, so hoarding is also at different times lumped as part of OCD, OCPD, which is Obsessive Compulsive Personality Disorder, which isn't the same thing as OCD. So OCD, OC, person, Obsessive Compulsive Personality Disorder is a little more like someone who's excessively perfectionistic and needs things a certain way and has to have things aligned and working a certain way or gets worried or anxious about it. Um, so interestingly, when it was given its own status as a specific diagnosis, it was lumped in, it still is to this day, with the obsessive compulsive disorder spectrum conditions and just to run through what the other conditions in that group are. So we have OCD, we have hoarding, we have body dysmorphic disorder, which is people who have obsessive beliefs that part of, you know, my nose is too big or it's bent to one side or my muscles aren't big enough or body size. So there's an overlap with eating disorders. So I look ridiculously fat, whether I am or not. So body dysmorphic disorder, trichotillomania, which is hair pulling often of the scalp, but it can be in other parts of the body and excoriation syndrome, which is disorder, which is also called skin picking, where people obsessively focus on blemishes and spend hours trying to remove them from their body, even if they have awareness that they may be causing more damage or ugliness than the lesion itself, or maybe they don't even have a lesion. And the other conditions in the OCD spectrum family are substance-induced OCD, or medica medical condition induced OCD. So actually amphetamine and psychosis or amphetamine toxicity can produce a skin picking sensation of formication with an M, not an N, 
that ants or other insects are crawling on the body. There's a few medical conditions that can also um, cause OCD-like symptoms. And interestingly, OC, obsessive compulsive personality disorder, is not in the OC spectrum of by DSM-5 because it's lumped with the other personality disorders. So the definition of hoarding itself is that someone's having a persistent difficulty discarding possessions regardless of their value. So some people who haven't been watching the television shows and aren't familiar often think that hoarding is fundamentally about gathering more stuff in, going out and collecting things, but it's the other half of the picture. Hoarding is more about difficulty discarding or getting rid of things. And that dis so, so the other criteria is they have that's difficulty discarding possessions regardless of their value. They have a perceived need, they need to save these items and there's distress if they are forced to discard them, which results in three, an accumulation of items and a massive accumulation of items which causes either congestion filling up space or clutter. So it's disorganized congestion. And to meet the full criteria that that has to cause either distress that someone's upset or worried about what their space looks like or what they've been doing or impaired functioning, social functioning, work functioning. So you might not think it's a problem, but if you've piled your work cubicle so high that you're Cups are falling off and spilling over the barrier to the next person on the other side of your partial wall, or you are causing, you're so embarrassed that nobody comes over, you have no social life. Those are impairments of social functioning, work functioning. Or another impairment of functioning could be if you're creating a situation through your clutter, through your accumulation, that, that your space is unsafe and often, People who are clutterers you know, deny that having all these flammable 40-year-old newspapers in next to your space eater isn't really, they haven't gone up in flames yet. So, but, but often authorities are called in because actually this can be unsafe. And there's certainly case reports, not just of fires, but of people being crushed in the mass of their accumulated clutter when it collapsed. So the other two parts of the official definition is that can't be due to another medical condition. It can't be due to another psychiatric condition. And there's two um, ways to augment or, or add sort of footnotes to the diagnosis. And that is with or without excessive acquisition. So again, most of the time or the focus of hoarding is on not getting rid of, but some people do go actively trolling the streets for bottle caps and other broken pieces of glass or excessive acquisition of items. And the other area where the diagnosis can be augmented is by indicating the level of insight. So this ranges from people who have no real awareness that what they're doing is different or weird or problematic or causing problems to people who have a fair amount of insight and just feel powerless, unable, to change it or get rid of items. So it's important to differentiate hoarding from collecting. So collecting is acquiring certain objects with a specific plan, with some notion of the value of these items. And again, that doesn't mean they have to be wildly expensive items, but there's a plan, there's organization, and it's bringing joy. Whereas hoarding doesn't usually bring joy to people, it brings some distress if they lose their things, but they're not saying, gosh, I'm so happy I have 400 bubblegum wrappers in my, under my bed right now. So also some would differ differentiate hoarding from saving items for a specific use. Because when you ask someone, particularly people who don't have a lot of insight, you know, why are you saving all the mail that's come into your house for the last three years? their answers are usually sort of vague that someday you might need some of that paper. So it's not that they're saving specific records for a specific use and know how to reference them and find them readily. The other potential issue some people claim is that this is a culturally bound diagnosis. And yet when researchers have gone into a diverse range of other communities and cultures around the world, there are 
individuals who are hoarders and different cultures may have different ideas of what's important to save or different actual needs on what's important to save. But cult cluttering, accumulation of items that don't seem to have great value, hoarding does seem to be present across different cultures. There's also a little bit of research into very little rigorous research, more sort of speculative and psychoanalytic, psychodynamic, as to whether deprivation in the early, particularly childhood years, has some role in contributing to hoarding behavior. I mean, in general, if it were primarily a deprivation, we would see higher rates in lower socioeconomic groups and not. That doesn't seem to be strongly borne out by the data. We would also expect to be substantial cohort differences where, for example, people who grew up during the depression, Great Depression might have higher rates than when times were flush. And again, there's not a lot of rigorous data, but that doesn't seem to be the primary driving force. And again, getting back to the, the, the items that are commonly hoarded are usually items that most other people and often the person themselves agree don't have a lot of intrinsic monetary value. Um, so uh, items that are most often found among hoarders, mail, opened or un unopened, newspapers that may be become a thing of the past as newspapers become less common, Old bills that come in and have been paid, medications, so you've finished your course of treatment and you have three pills or 20 pills or you had side effects and stopped right away. But even though there are at pharmacies and other locations ways to dispose of medications safely and certainly people dispose of them unsafely, um, some people can't let go of medication. And the other big item is clothes and or tied in with that difficulty doing laundry. So dirty clothes are piling up and some of that. So getting into what's, I, I mentioned again that, and originally this was placed in the OCD spectrum, but when people looked at the core, you know, the core for an OCD spectrum is having obsessive obsessions or having compulsions, and those aren't particularly a feature of hoarding. Now, there are some people who do hoard and have a compulsive element to it, or who really believe that if they save every cigarette carton or maybe some they have some delusional belief that there's some magic or something magically wonderful will happen if they collect them all um, but usually these aren't compulsions these aren't full-blown delusions so so when people have done studies looking at what are what is hoarding behavior hoarding disorder associated with um, the, the the most common comorbid symptoms are depression or anxiety. So in a few studies, and part of the difficulty of studying hoarding is that many of the hoarding studies have been based on people who voluntarily came forward or were volunteered by family or other members to get into treatment groups or treatment facilities. So one, they tend to skew female, they tend to skew well-educated, they tend to skew elderly. The other data suggests that hoarding is pretty roughly equal, one-to-one -one male to female. Um, so again, the studies looking at comorbidities, so, so depression, anxiety occur in about two thirds of people with hoarding disorders, but compared to control groups of that age and demographics, that isn't hugely higher. Again, what shows up the strongest connection looking at factor analyses and more sophisticated um, analyses is ADHD itself. So ADHD is a condition most closely associated. Um, again, rates of ADHD in the general population of adults are probably on the order of 4%, usually lower finding in studies because ADHD itself tends to be under addressed, under diagnosed, under realized, um, as does hoarding. But about um, among hoarders, about an the study, 25 to 30 plus percent have ADHD. And again, what's unusual is that's even looking at the group that was predominantly 
elderly, well-educated women where we would expect, given it's just the gender, even lower rates than the general population for ADHD. And um, looking at OCD, formal OCD, again, that there is some overlap, but it's closer to 20% of people with hoarding fit and also an OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder diagnosis. So looking at it sort of the other way, um, one fairly recent study, 2022, looked at patients with ADHD and to see how prevalent hoarding was within them and looked at OCD patients to see how prevalent among OCD patients. So that's looking at the question the other way around. What they found out was about 30%, 32% of ADHD patients did meet full criteria for hoarding disorder, but it's only about 8% of OCD patients um, and about only 4% in this study of healthy controls. Other studies range anywhere from about 1% to 4% of the general population meeting criteria for hoarding disorder. Um, so the studies finding the association with ADHD, most of them have particularly singled out or found a connection between inattentive ADHD and hoarding disorder. Um, we'll get into a little bit of why that might be in a second. And it's also important to highlight again, even though this is more an issue through different television shows in the popular media, people are aware of it. Lots of people don't come forward. Again, there's lack of insight may be an issue, but also shame is a big issue. And given that most of the time the clutter is in their home and they're not bringing it into the office, um, they don't have to necessarily reveal what's going on. So Carol Matthews, who's a psychiatrist, who's one of the world experts on hoarding disorder, her lab has found that one of the most useful questions to ask as a screening tool is do you sometimes do how often do you not let people into your home because of a clutter problem and even people who are not insightful about having a problem are in, often aware that they are not inviting people over because of fear of judgment of how it would look and her preliminary reports are that that question if someone answers either sometimes or always they're not letting people in that's about 80% sensitivity for showing that someone has hoarding disorder. Um, so it's recommended that anyone who's being screened and seems positive for ADHD, you should be asking questions about hoarding. And another interesting tool we have out there is there's something called the clutter image rating scale. So there are pictures of different degrees of clutteredness and asking someone how much their house, their bedroom, their kitchen, their relaxation room or couch look like this picture with varying degrees of no clutter to buried literally several feet in clutter. That can be a useful tool, particularly for people who aren't insightful that this pattern of behavior is aberrant and or may be causing problems. Um, so cluttering is usually the most common way it's treated is by cognitive behavioral therapy and the cognitive behavioral therapy for hoarding feels that there's sort of four different domains that it focuses on. One is problems with information processing. So getting back to the ADD and the attentive connection, the claim, and this is not particularly rigorously tested that often the accumulation begins often through inattentive or other cognitive deficits so that sort of you're finished eating and you drop the wrappers there or you're finished eating and rather than keeping it in short-term memory to take the bottle over the sink and rinse it out and put it in the recycling it's just there under the bed so the initial accumulation often seems to happen through information processing deficits and then it's compounded the four other domains addressed by cognitive behavioral approaches are beliefs about hoarding in terms of what the person thinks they are accomplishing or doing or helping or why they're doing it. Um, it also addresses their emotional attachment to the items and it addresses their avoidance in why aren't they dealing with or getting rid of it. Um, and again, avoidance, procrastination are all features of 
inattentive ADHD, so it's not surprising that there's an overlap. Even though the cognitive behavioral therapy approaches seem to be the, again, the, 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 the sort of a standard recommendation, um, there are a few studies showing that they can be effective, but some of the studies show less than 50% rate for substantially getting, minimizing or getting rid of clutter. So increasingly there's modifications of cognitive behavioral approaches using things, um, thoughts or framing from evolutionary psychology, using harm reduction models, using motivational in interviewing. Um, so some of these include the harm reduction model would be sort of approaching things from you know, if the fire department's saying you might lose your apartment because you have so much clutter, what do we have to do to make it safe enough to pass the inspection? So we don't even have to say that it's causing you distress or that you're, or the problem, it's that our society is saying it's causing a danger to you. What can we do to mitigate that so you can stay in your apartment? Um, and so, so motivational interviewing relies on the principles of autonomy that the person gets to decide what's important for them and they get to make the decisions about what's going on and it stresses that as my job as a psychiatrist i'm not here to help people i'm here to help you help yourself that might be by providing prescriptions for medications or counseling or other framework but i'm not going to change someone's brain or mind i'm going to help them change themselves other precepts of motivational interviewing that are combined are acceptance. So where things are now is acceptable. But we may again move to harm what would be better, what would be cleaner, safer, more rewarding, where it would give you more space, but accepting where things are now, meeting people where they're at. The concept of adaptation, so that some of what you're doing may have been an adaptation to your circumstances. It may be helpful. It may be and this is the important insight from evolutionary psychology. Humans evolved over millions of years when most of their lifetimes of individuals and tribes and kingdoms were periods of deprivation and stress and saving, scavenging, holding on to anything you got hold of may have been a useful trait where it's, so the behavior itself is not necessarily pathological. The problem is it may not fit your current living situation. And using empathy is another motivational interviewing. So showing that you are aligned, you understand and go of these items may cause pain, but having them in your space may also be causing pain, shame, and distress. And then evocation or trying to elicit internal motivation, helping the person sort out why for them it may be a good idea to change what's going on. So when I try to work with, and, and I should say over the years, this is one of the hardest, most recalcitrant sets of behaviors to change um, or help people change. Some of the tools I use, particularly working with people with ADHD, I mean, one is a simple CBT task of breaking it into manageable chunks. Do not tell yourself if your bed is buried three feet in garbage. And, and I do have people I've worked with who are literally, it is garbage. It is old fast food containers. It's empty bottles. It's their meditation, medication empty containers. It's piles of mail opened and unopened. So, so break it into manageable, manageable chunks that a half hour, set an hour. Don't say, I'm going to spend the next three days clearing everything out. You may be able to do with it, do that, but it's likely to be such a daunting task that you're not even going to start. Second technique I use is visual imagery. So one is sometimes if you have a picture of what your couch used to look like when you could see it as a couch or your bed or your bedroom as a reminder of what it could be, or if you don't and you just have a picture of clutter on top of it, maybe finding an Ikea catalog or some minimalist Scandinavian furniture store to show an image of what it could be like, to remind yourself this could change. And also taking periodic, you know, if you're going to devote an hour, take a picture now and take a picture at the end of the hour. Because again, at the end of the hour, you may still have a huge pile of clutter and it may feel overwhelming again. But if you can compare that to where it was even an hour before when you had even more mess to show that 
that hour did have an impact. That can be helpful. And then I have a whole separate video about this, but my procrastination video about the spawn approach, which is schedule, prepare, wants and no negatives, I think is helpful for addressing hoarding. So schedule a specific time. If you say, I'm gonna do an hour this week, this week never comes by. But if you say Tuesday at three, I will spend an hour doing it. It's much more likely to happen. Schedule a specific hour, prepare ahead. If you need garbage bags, if you need a recycling bin, if you need fumigants and Lysol ahead of time, make sure you have it ready before. So when the time comes, you're ready to go. Um, and W, so the, the pivot point of my spawn approach is once. When you're facing a big task like this, almost always the negatives are gonna come up. This is too much work. This is too much press. I can't ever manage this. It's gonna be unbearable. And I don't want to. I'd rather be watching reruns of the State of the Union address or X, Y, or Z. So wants means getting in touch with, why do you want this? Why do you want to have a clean apartment? Do you wanna have friends over? Do you wanna have X, Y, or Z? There must be some real want inside of you that you can align with and that usually you can be aware of when thinking about this, but are usually uppermost when you're facing the task. So writing those down, having them there to remind yourself. And then the no negatives is just not even engaging in any discussion about, should I do this? Can I not do this? Should I do it at a different time? It's just doing it and knowing if it was a ridiculous idea to wake up at 3 a.m. in the morning and do it, you don't have to schedule at that time again. So, so Increasingly, one of the other approaches beyond the cognitive behavioral approach and one that some of the experts and Carol Matthews, the reporting expert I cited before is, is an advocate for this, is having peer support seems to be as important or in some cases as valuable as experienced therapists in terms of it's cheaper, it tends to be more available, it tends to be at least as effective and that's having someone and, and there's in the hoarding community, it's known as having a clutter buddy. In the ADHD community, there's a term called body doubling. Having someone come in, often not even helping you with the work, but just being there, being present for someone that's mirroring some of the spawn approach for a set period of time can help you stay on track, help you feel motivated, help you feel accountable to another. Um, and, and again, it, it's I've seen it work where weeks and months of repeating the same CBT for ADHD approaches didn't help much reporting. A quick note on medication, there are a few studies, that I wouldn't even call them studies, they tend to be more case series of case examples. A few people on Ritalin who reporting got better, a few people on uh, Enlefaxine, Effexor, reporting got better, a few people on SSRI. So the SSRIs, are the standard treatment for OCD, full-blown. It tends not to be as effective in as great a percentage of people or for as full a range of resolution of symptoms as they do for depression, but they're still the standard treatment. There's a few case reports, I would call them more collections that they can be helpful for some people in hoarding but success rates are pretty low, sample sizes are extremely small, and I'm not aware of any formal ongoing studies or may well be looking at other medications. So pretty much done with this topic. Next week's topic is stimulants in children. Do they help or harm children's brains? And I do see there's some questions, so I'll put my glasses on. Um, I will, before I jump into the new questions, I'm gonna address one question that came up last week, and I'm not even remembering who brought it up, but someone asked whether the threat of valvulopathy, heart valve problems with guanfacine is a real or valid concern based on that it has some action on serotonin 2B receptors. And the most I could come up with is that that problem was being substantially addressed or raised more than 15 years ago, mostly about 10, 12 years ago. So people are aware of it. I've consulted with a cardiologist friend of mine and he's not aware of any data that would substantiate an elevated level of 
val our valve problem risks with taking guanfacine either for ADHD or for high blood pressure. Um, so it's mildly reassuring that people have been aware of the potential theoretically and have been looking for it, um, but I'm not aware of any body of data that substantiates it's turned out to be a real risk. And again, guanfacine has been around much you know, more than 30 years as a antihypertensive. So Dennis, hello, Dennis has a question. Ah, good. Dennis brought up the topic, people can be digital hoarders and you'd never know it. Um, yeah, so there's one paper I ran across. So two other sort of offbeat um, hoarding topics that have come up are digital hoarding. So that digital hoarding is you know, collecting thousands of pictures of something or having collecting tabs or references to other sites and having so much that it's causing a clutter or accumulation or I guess if you saved enough, you could even slow down how quickly you can access things on your computer, but it's not messing your the rest of your living, lived physical environment, so it's harder to detect. The other area that's come up in, in some special notations is animal hoarding. So there are some people who believe they're doing great and wonderful things for animals because they're the only one who can treat them well or save them or rescue them. And on average, these animal hoarders have more than 40 animals under their care. And in at least the cases that come to usually public health authorities questions, they're, they are unquestionably taking care of more, I won't even say care because it's not care, have more animals under their control than they are able to take care of. So almost always there are starving, medically untreated, dying, dead, rotting animals on their present premises. And yet these individuals do feel that they can't let go of any animals and that their care is providing something special or needed. So, so Mark Rendon says, I'm late diagnosed and collect things, but they're usually used for art pieces and I try to clear them out every few months. So. So again, it highlights that collecting is distinct from hoarding. Um, there may be areas, particularly with sort of found art or found items, that's that's a whole genre in the art world where, but most of those people go out and they may have some stash of material at hand, but are usually going out and collecting specifically for a project or set of projects rather than holding on to everything that comes into their possession and not getting rid of it with the vague idea that someday there might be an art project they make of it. Um, so Mr. AKA 1996 says, Dr. William Dodson said that ADHD people are tremendously loyal and therefore make very good friends. Agree or disagree based on your clinical experience. That's a loaded question uh, based on my clinical experience and personal experience. Um, I think there's certain ADHD traits, particularly spontaneity, particularly excitement about things and enthusiasm um, that can make people with ADHD fun to be around. I'm not aware of any rigorous data regarding loyalty, and one could argue exactly the opposite, that some of the data, whether it's on divorce rates, whether on relationship breakdowns separate from whether you were married or not, that people with ADHD are more likely to have less lengthy relationships. Um, my approach to that more is why actually in our society, and I can agree being a Parent, that there are value with, with our nuclear family model for parents staying together to raise kids. But what I'm getting at is why do we think, and we clearly do as a society, we glorify someone who's been married, a couple married 50 years. Why is that intrinsically better than five 10-year marriages or 10 five-year marriages? Why wouldn't we be celebrating having a diversity of 
different partners, learning as much from each of them as you can. And when that's saturated, when you hit the slow point on your learning curve, moving on and getting something new and valuable from a different set of relationships. So, so are there certain individuals with ADHD that are tremendously loyal? Absolutely. Are there some that are tremendously loyal for many years and then lose interest and move on? Yeah. Um, but again, why we value longevity, I can see some reasons for it, but I'd say I, I think we overvalue it without considering what we're actually valuing there. So that may be how I try to answer that question. And Cosmos Princess, do you think Wellbutrin significantly improves ADHD symptoms? So I have a whole video on that and it's in the live section. So, so again, on my channel, this is the way YouTube does things and I can't break it out. There's older videos that were mostly recorded on Facebook that are there in the video section. And there are, I think, almost as many right now on the live section. And if you look quickly, if you're in the video section, you don't even see the live section, but it's there in the live section. My summary is absolutely there is good data that Wellbutrin can help. Doesn't help everybody, but neither does Adderall. Um, and I would argue that the data is pretty robust, that it works about as well as Ritalin and means helps about the same percentage of people, helps them to the same extent. I have a number of people that that's the best medication that they've responded to um, and they felt safer, more comfortable on it, it's certainly more accessible. I've certainly had people who tried it and it didn't work or who it worked partially and it supplements the stimulant or other medication. What else was I gonna say about it? Maybe that's it. It's cheap, accessible, there is documented evidence it works um, and it doesn't work for everybody. So I'm not seeing any more questions. So I'm glad you were all here. Uh, there's good topics to go into. Um, so Mark was asking, is there a more natural way? And I'm assuming more natural way for treating or addressing ADHD. The best, so the stimulants don't work for everyone. The stimulants do have serious potential, but low frequency risks of addiction, of psychosis, of heart problems. Um, but the data is pretty robust so far. They help the greatest percentage of people. They help them to the fullest extent or more extensively than other approaches. I think medications alone are almost never going to be the answer for anyone with ADHD. I'm a strong opponent of CBT-based behavioral and cognitive approaches for addressing ADHD. Um, and those are almost impossible, even for really bright, really motivated, because I have lots of people who are really bright and really motivated people with ADHD. You're not going to pick up a workbook and teach yourself these techniques. If you could and did, you wouldn't need the workbook. So almost always those are group or individual therapy based approaches to work on. Whether some of the other approaches that I would say are so, so more natural, I mean, there's so certainly biofeedback approaches have been around for decades, um, charging people lots and lots of money and lots and lots of time. And the data so far is so underwhelming that some experts have said they should just shut down that whole industry. That I think is probably overly negative, but it's amazing how little good data there is there. Um, there's some maybe more refined video, interactive learning training modules. The issue there is we still don't know how fully well what's learned in a playing a game is translatable to real life, real world ADD situations. So. So stay healthy, stay happy. I will be back next week at the same time. And thanks for contributing your questions and thoughts. And if you like this 
channel, recommend it to others.